Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we welcome you to our final segment of Guggenheim Abu Dhabi Talking Art Series of this year. I would like to introduce the first commissioned artwork for the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi co Collection, Abu Dhabi, by internationally acclaimed contemporary artist Sarah Morris, that is now on view here at Manat Sadiat for the next three months. And we encourage you to go and see it over and over and over again and bring your friends and family. Sarah Morris is known for using the medium of film to create moving image portraits of historically significant places around the world at transformative points in time. The film Abu Dhabi will take viewers on a visual journey across the capital. This first commission has been in under development for several years and has been led by the co-curators of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi team, Mesa El Qasmi and Sasha Kalter Wasserman. I would like to introduce our colleague, Dr. Alexander Monroe, Senior Curator and Senior Advisor, Global Arts of the Solomon R. Guggenheim Foundation to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Sara, and thank you for your contribution to uh, bringing the Sarah Morris film and installing it so beautifully here in Manarat. Uh, it is exquisite, immersive, and most importantly, the artist is happy. Uh, so it is my pleasure uh, to introduce my dear friend Sarah Morris and Phil Tenari, uh, who will be in conversation tonight walking through some of Sarah's, Sarah's work, not only in film, but as you'll see, the relationship of, of her film practice to her painting. So Sarah is uh, uh, an artist who was a graduate of Brown. I also went to Brown. so. We approve of that university. Um, and uh, participated in the Whitney Museum of American Art Independent Study Program. Uh, and uh, has been named a, a, a Philip Morris Fellow, an American Academy in Berlin Fellow, and has received the Joan Mitchell Painting Award, among many other accolades. Um, her work has been the subject of solo exhibitions at many of the world's most important museums of modern and contemporary art, including the uh, Neue National Gallery in Berlin, the Moderna Museet in Stockholm, Hamburger Bahnhof, uh, and most recently the UCCA in, uh, in Beijing. Um, her work is also collected by many uh, museums around the world, including the Guggenheim Museum, uh, where she has a long history with many of our curators in New York, and now, of course, here in Abu Dhabi. Um, also in the collection of SF MoMA, um, uh, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, and its state collection, um, the Tate Collection in London. And joining her tonight is her dear friend and colleague, Phil Tenari, uh, who is the director of the Ullen Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing uh, and has led its transformation from its founding now 11 years ago into China's leading independent institution of contemporary art, a transformation I have been privileged to witness and therefore can vouch for. Um, during his tenure, UCA's transition um, uh, had uh, has transformed into an accredited foundation working in the public interest. He has mounted during his uh, period there more than 70 exhibitions bringing to China such international figures as indeed Sarah Morris, whose show uh, was there last year, exactly a year ago. Uh, 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 also uh, exhibitions of Robert Rauschenberg, Elm Green and Dragset, Hegu Yang, William Kentridge, Terence Simon, and Tino Segal, and has has also presented both solo and group shows of many of China's leading um, artists, including Xu Bing, Zheng Fangzhi, Liu Wei, Xu Zhen, Wang Kuping, and others, many of whom, by the way, are in the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi collection. Uh, Phil is a graduate of Duke and also Harvard, uh, and is now, uh, uh, we hope, 
close to completing his uh, PhD work at um, uh, University uh, at, 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 at Oxford. Um, I also uh, have had the great privilege of working with Phil as co-curator on the exhibition Art in China after 1989 Theatre of the World, which opened at the Guggenheim Museum in New York a year ago, has traveled to Guggenheim Bilbao and is now just opened at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, a major exhibition that also features key loans from the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi collection. Um, so with that, I hand it over to Phil and Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander, for uh, such generous and um, friendly introductions based on so many years of, of knowing each other and working together. Um, it's, it's really great to be here on stage with you tonight, Sarah, and uh, my only regret is we, we only really have 45 minutes to, to talk and then we have time <laughs> for questions and we have, um, I think we have a lot of ground to cover, so let's, let's jump right in. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I thought one place to start because I think it's kind of fundamental to understanding your, your practice, your work as an artist, mm -hmm. is, to, is to think about or to, to know a little bit about the relationship between these two strands that seem to... Um, mirror and parallel and interweave with each other mm -hmm. over these really 20 years now mm -hmm. of, of, of making. Um, and those, of course, are film and painting. Um, and in fact, just before getting on the plane uh, to come to Abu Dhabi the other day, yesterday, although it was the day before in New York, um, I was really privileged to go to uh, your the uptown branch of Petzl, which is a gallery you work with, where actually right now and for a little while longer, you're showing the very first body of work that you made in this in this fashion, um, mm -hmm. and I think very appropriately, it's it starts from the neighborhood where you lived at the time, Midtown Manhattan, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 explores that as a way into all these other visual and conceptual themes. And these are some of the paintings uh, from this series called Midtown. Um, uh I yeah. actually didn't live in Midtown, but my studio was in Midtown. So the only area that was very inexpensive to have a studio in the early 90s, mid 90s, was Times Square, which I know sounds crazy, but it was, it was an area that was in between Uptown and Downtown. Chelsea sort of hadn't happened. And there was one building on 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue that uh, was was an artist studio building, and so that was where my first studio was, um, and it, I was sort of situated, sort of between this sort of like nether world of like pornography and mainstream corporate America, which was on Sixth Avenue, and I started to sort of think about that, this schism uh, between the redevelopment of what was going to happen uh, between you know all of these. Uh, spaces and uh, it was a very sort of strange uh, time because you knew that uh, the city was going to be redeveloped now now it's like they just announced Amazon is coming to my Your my studio my studio area now so um, it's constantly I mean that's the nature of the city right I mean I think about it too because this was it, uh, this was 1998 uh, and you made a it was only about an eight-minute film yeah right? um, and I, do we have a clip here? I'm not sure that we do. I don't think we do. Uh, which is fine. Yeah. But what it is, is it's, it's basically you're on the street watching. You, can you stop moving that fast? So, Wait. Yeah, so, <laughs> Are you doing that fast? Yeah, 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 or, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I am. Okay, we'll, um, we'll, we'll pick one and stay there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so in this film, you're essentially, um, you're watching as. Well, I was already working on the paintings. Um, and in a way, it's interesting because at the time, my studio was in London. So um, this idea about Midtown had formed earlier and this experience of sort of uh, this corporate world or dealing or positing the artist as dealing with mainstream America, not the marginal as subject matter, but actually uh, dealing with sort of this slightly repulsive world of um, corporate America, was, which is where my studio had been. I started thinking of, because um, we move through those spaces constantly. They're very beautiful, but they're very intimidating, and they're also um, you know, uh, constantly in flux. Uh, a lot of the titles of these paintings 
For instance, Payne Weber with Neon is no longer Payne Weber. Alliance Capital is no longer Alliance Capital. So in a way, it was like staging out or mapping out uh, almost like a game of Monopoly, you know, uh, which places and which real estate occupied my zone. And um, I started thinking about painting them. Um, and I was very interested in the work of, of course, like Richter and Liechtenstein, and also the work of Brotars uh, and Judd. I was interested in somehow tapping into this idea of seriality and um, the capitalist form. And I, I, there was a show that I was invited to be in at the Ludwig Museum. It was, an, it, it was a survey show of American artists sort of from my generation. And I'd always wanted to make a short film. So I asked the museum director if they would give me a budget to make a film that would sort of function like a manifesto or an atlas, so to speak, of the indexes of um, what was going on in the paintings. I sort of wanted to take control of that. And just to be clear, in the paintings, would it be correct to say that you're kind of distilling a formal uh, vocabulary of abstraction from the architectural forms that you found yourself surrounded by. And of course, in a refracted and not super direct way. But if we look at this gridded um, composition, it's talking about kind of modernism in the international style. It's talking about what you just said, the kind of corporate sublime. Um, it, it's talking about a built environment and a lived space uh, that, was, that you were observing and participating in. Yes, it was definitely like my, my habitat. But I also thought it was like, you know, rhetorically our habitat. I don't really think that there's any, um, and I'm not trying to be funny here, but it's like, I don't really feel like there, uh, my position is, is I, I don't really feel like there is an outside. There's not an inside and an outside. Like I can't say that I'm not complicit with the oil industry or I'm not complicit with, you know, like these, things are, these things are part of all of our lives and you have to sort of contend with it. And how you contend with it as an artist um, doesn't mean you don't have, it doesn't mean that everything is affirmative. It just means that you have to place yourself within that world. So that's sort of where I started. And so, I mean, so in this series of paintings, we, we see, um, as we just said, a, a kind of a vocabulary developing. In the film, we also see a vocabulary developing. It's a film that, I, I mean, my impression of this film, and it's, it really is very close to home for me because that's, I was in college at that yeah. time and I remember yeah. going to New yeah. York and yeah. just, it's what it felt like, right? Yeah. It's people in the fashions of the of kind of high Clintonian America, uh, pre 9-11, pre -9 um, walking, walking around and sweating. And uh, well, it's it's sort of it, it's it's corporate America or Midtown America, but it's it it's it, it posits the in between spaces also, uh, which hasn't really been much written about, but how people use spaces, how they're um, subverting spaces, how they're operating in between. So the, the brief that I had, I, I took out a news crew for a single day. That was my, my, my idea of how to get the film accomplished. So I hired this news crew to be with me for a day. And we had a list of places, just like coordinates of what we were gonna like hit. It's kind of how you still work, I, it, it, Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and so we would go to those places. So we would go to like Chase headquarters, we would go to Port Authority, we would go to the Seagram's building, which I loved, um, which by the way, uh, uh, later, Phyllis Lambert, yeah, like, well, I later then did a, did a film that used it, but like, you know, the Seagram's building, which is thought to be like high modernism, you know, uh, is an interesting thing I had, I, dinner once with Phyllis Lambert who commissioned Mies van der Rohe to do that building and she said you know Sarah you have to remember and this is something I didn't know uh, that the Seagram's building was a fast track building you know I mean so this is sort of interesting that like not you, this idea that everything uh, it, it is some it is like a fetish for time is not always the case like good things come out of R uh, rush rush well, or we can talk about that in relation to our <laughs> exhibition yeah um the, the other thing i just wanted to bring up in yeah. relation to that film because i think it sets up so much else in the other films is the relationship to music yeah because it's set to a soundtrack yeah um but there is there's there's an adrenaline and a volume in the paintings too i mean you see that in the early text paintings um that i've always wanted to capture and that was sort of the brief 
uh, that, you know, that Liam and I discussed when he wrote the first soundtrack for Midtown. Um, the music is, is all done um, sort of removed from image, meaning that the music is composed not to image. Like uh, it's given to me in sort of units, slightly like John Cage, like given to me as sort of modular units, which I put down to image later on. And sometimes they're in conjunction or harmony with image, and sometimes they're deliberately done against image. If that makes sense. It makes, I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so for time's sake, yeah. because, so what happens, I think, in Midtown as you develop this way of working, and it's a, it's a methodology and a position mm -hmm. that, that proves to be a very compelling lens to look at different kinds of situations. And, mm -hmm. and let's say, let's not say different places. Let's call it streamlined. Streamlined, okay. Yeah. Um, so you go on from there to make a film called Capital, mm -hmm. which is actually about the waning days of the Clinton administration. You're, and, you're, yeah. and you're getting access. You're in the cabinet room. That was, in, that was in the last few months of Clinton's administration. And it was clear that the country was on a major, like there was going to be a very big transition. No one really knew what it was going to be yet, but it was clear that there was going to be this transition. So I was, already, I was already working on the paintings. And again, like the paintings and the films are always going on and, and they're simultaneous. It's not one directional, uh, meaning it's not that the paintings come first and then the film happens or vice versa. It's usually an, an, or an, or an organic sort of process where you know, the film idea is there, I'm investigating that, I'm talking to people about that, and then the paintings are happening at the same time. And they're very, very different, you know? I mean, it almost could be the work of two different people. I mean, the sense of like, um, you know, the, the, the paintings are very uh, slow to produce. There's an economy of uh, time is sort of slowed down. There's a very specific process of, of mapping out uh first it starts with photography and discussion uh with you know and, and internally about what is the map you know what is the map of washington dc and maybe maybe national geographics on that map as well as the department of energy you know th there's there's this play with titles with my paintings that that gets sort of figured out and then interestingly enough that same type of reasoning goes into the films. And but the films are, you know, obviously they happen very fast. It's a very collaborative effort. It's like they cost quite a bit to make compared to the paintings. And, and so this, these two different economies of time that go on in the studio, uh, one is like very slow and very um, almost like therapeutic and uh, very precise with coordinates and color and compositions. And, and then the films start with coordinates too. Uh, I often say they're the, same, they're the same process, but from different ends of the spectrum. And, and the films start from coordinates as well. But what's different about the films is there's a lot of things about the films that I don't know ahead of time. Yeah. And from this, I mean, as you continued, it was from DC to Miami to Las Vegas to Chicago, um, you made a you made an amazing film about LA that kind of went under the skin of the yeah. of the image producing you know image of machine of, yeah. of the film industry. Um, I made a film about the film industry. You made a film yeah. about the film industry. Yeah. That's true. And then, actually, there's this there's this next breakthrough in 2008. Um, and one thing that's interesting, Alexander mentioned the show Art in China after 1989 that we worked on together. You're actually the only American artist in this exhibition of. It of, is quite strange uh, that I ended up in that show, or that I ended up in China. Um, and I should explain why. It was really, I mean, I view that every city or every series of my work is linked to the next work and is linked to the previous body of work. And when I was working on the Los Angeles um, film and paintings, I was so overwhelmed with dealing with all these egos in, in Los Angeles and producers and directors and actors and some people who didn't want to be represented in the film without a script, without lighting. You know, my films are shot cinema verite, so it, that was sort of complicated to get anybody to participate 
without knowing all of these things. Most of the time, they know exactly what the script is, who's producing, who's directing, you know, hair and makeup and costumes and the rest of it. So it was, it was tricky. So around the time I was in Los Angeles working on that film and doing those paintings, um, I started to think about catapulting myself to China. I mean, probably it had, there was an overlap because Spielberg had been announced to be the director uh, of the 2008 Olympics, if you remember, and then he had to um, resign, resign that because of Ronan Farrow's letter to the Wall Street Journal. Um, that was like was when he was Ronan 18. Farrow? Yeah, it was. It was Ronan Farrow. And um, uh, I started to think about cat, you know, making a schism between Los Angeles and this sort of the idea of the personality or the ego as a uh, corporation to China, where I felt like I wanted to deal with this, like um, a sense of uh, a very different sense of self. And I started to think about the seriality also in form, you know, I mentioned about paintings, but, and, and about artists that I felt that had dealt with the serial form, but I was thinking about the Olympics in relation to the city as a serial form and how it happens every, well, two years, but let's call it four years, depending on winter or summer Olympics, that, this, that you have this thread throughout history weaving all these places together and that, you know, for me was really interesting to, to deal with. And I, I sort of naively went to Beijing not knowing anybody. And maybe Hans Zurich told me to like meet you and meet a few other people. Um, and um, I quickly realized that actually that, that the Olympics is not something that is, is, is self-controlled, meaning that Beijing was not really in charge of the Beijing Olympics. It was really Switzerland. So everybody was like, you actually, you know, they, they said yes, but then they said, but you really have to go to the International Olympic Committee, which that was very, very difficult to deal with. Um, because no, I think there's always this element of like the endurance performance of gaining access to the place where you're trying to yeah. work. And, and some people ask me, is that a game? And it is sort of a game. In is it a, a finite game or an infinite game? It's probably both. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it is a game and it is a rhetoric in a way about, you know, can an artist put a camera in the cabinet room of the White House? Can an artist get access to these sort of very, very uh, mainstream world events, events that are on television and are photographed or cinematographically sort of set up by other people all the time we see these images. I mean, can you shoot or film a president on the South Lawn of the White House? Right. You know? From a different, slightly different From angle. From a different angle. Can, can you do that? And the answer is, is I think, is, is yes. And I think that's like a very deliberate sort of positioning uh, with the work. But then also, it's not just a game, because I really do want to get those images and be able to create almost like a situationism uh, for the viewer, that you're not only in this type of uh, virtual architecture of the paintings and you're overwhelmed by the, the interconnectedness of the paintings and, and how vast they are and how the eye continues the line past the edge of the stretcher and you're constantly looking at them in space. It's impossible to look at my work and not continue it. Um, and that led me to a lot of different site-specific projects too, but it also is is a, it's like a positioning, yeah. And there's a, there's I think almost above all there's like a deconstruction of monumentality, right? I mean I always think in your Beijing film there's that one scene it's the image of those Beijing Olympics, the the procession of soldiers with the giant Chinese flag marching towards the flagpole and the children singing and the minority nationalities doing their thing and. In your film, it's, I think you, you were there on the night of the dress rehearsal, and you get it just from this, from this completely other angle, and suddenly the whole thing just appears as kind of a veneer or a performance. Well, you know, when, I, when I've thought about the idea of, because there's always a spectacle in, my, uh, in the films anyway, you know, uh, and I try to make that also in the shows, uh, that, especially the one I did with you, but um, that the, the spectacle has to be sort of discussed and analyzed, or the event rather, has to be talked about in terms of, I'm interested in it anyway. 
you know, before the event, the anticipation of the event, the production of the event, then the event itself, which is like the televised event, and then the ignoring of the event. Like in, in the Beijing film, you have great moments of like people sleep, you know, because a lot of people didn't see that. You know, like, I mean, the rest of the city ignored it, you know, I mean, most people didn't go to it. I mean, there was a, a political problem because of that, you know, like that obviously people had to be excluded because you can't have everybody uh, in that one place at the same time. But, um, you know, this idea of, uh, of the, uh, the post, pre and post production of the event is something that's somehow in all of the films, yeah? Yeah, and I, the other thing, just as a larger point, mm -hmm. it's um, in that Beijing film, which is I think 86, 90, it's feature length, yeah. essentially. So yeah. they, they grow in kind of scale, complexity, ambition, time over a period. And, and one thing you did in that film that I think you do in a lot of the later films as well is you, you created characters, and in this case, it was the architects of some of those key buildings. So coming back to architecture and heirs to modernism, but you have um, you know, Jacques Herzog and you have Rem Koolhaas who built the, the bird's nest and, and designed the, the CCTV building, uh, appearing as these kind of protagonists of this new, new city that's being built. Well, it's interesting. They appear as protagonists, but actually, you know, I went, I went when I was making the Beijing film, I went and, and, and talked to, uh, Jacques Herzog and tried to find out if they could be uh, like uh, gatekeepers in a way to help me with the project. And um, I realized, actually they said to me, no, we can't. And I was like, why, why can't you? And they're like, we're just janitors. Is I remember what they said, but it's, it's, it's a funny relationship that the architect has to like the state. And um, they're not always in control. Certainly, they don't see themselves in control. And that goes, you know, uh, in many situations that they're not always in control of their own projects. Uh, so it was interesting to film them. They were there as private citizens that night. They really weren't invited. Yeah. Um, let's skip ahead and talk about the film that's on display here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's been really amazing to see it find its uh, it's find its way back here first of all, and yeah. and have its premiere um, as part of as the first commissioned work of the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi collection. Um, but uh, maybe maybe one place to start is what kinds of how have your conversations around the film been with people who've had a chance to see it now that it's uh, now that it's showing? No, that's not it. We're we still need to come forward. One second. Well, these are the paintings. Yes. But well, I think it, I don't know where, if, if we have a clip of the film. We, we do. should, this yes. Is here's this here's film clip. Do you want to play this? Why not? Yeah, let's. Yeah, want to play it? Can we play this film clip? There we go. We can't we can move. I mean, what, what, what's well, there's a lot of conversations that go on yeah. uh, as I'm making the work, and and in a way, uh, I love I love that idea that Warhol uh, created around the mag. You know, when he did Interview Magazine, and he was and and I remember reading a long time ago that he he viewed that as an excuse to meet people, mm -hmm. and 
in a way, the films allow me another type of space in the studio to think about projecting myself and, and traveling and having lots of discussions with people. And so making the film Abu Dhabi uh, was uh, many years. I think the first conversation I had was probably in 2010 or 2011. I'm not even sure when it first started, but it was about, I, I suppose it was when uh, you know, they, they first started to think about uh, placing, you know, uh, inviting Frank Gehry to make a, a, a building here, and it was uh, started to be discussed, and I started thinking about it. And then I came here to do a lecture in maybe uh, 2011, yeah. So that was probably the first time I came and, and started to talk to people about the project. And what was your research process like? Well, it's not anything uh, linear, that's for sure. Uh, it's like many, many different factors from meeting uh, students to talking uh, to curators to talking to translators, for instance, Dr. Zaki, uh, or going to the Falcon Hospital, meeting Dr. Margit. Muller, who's the sort of falcon expert from Bavaria, who runs a fantastic uh, clinic for falcons, um, which actually are, are, are brought here from elsewhere, you know, realizing, uh, you know, just basically like listening to people's stories, yeah, using, I mean, I always think of like people are portals to place, and, and if you listen to those stories, you can sort of really observe things on a different in a different in a different way. And how about the the paintings that grew out of Abu Dhabi or that yeah. kind of happened in relation to the yeah. film? Well, this is called Control Tower. There's a lot of sort of there, there's always hidden imagery or not so hidden, but um, I love the Control Tower of the Abu Dhabi airport. And actually, that's one spot where we 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 worked really hard. That was probably the most difficult scene we shot was in the top of that Control Tower. Um, just because no one had ever filmed in there and it involves a lot of security issues. But anyway, the paintings, um, I wanted to have a sense of camouflage. I looked at a lot of images of, of desert and also of QR codes and I sort of somehow spliced them together in my mind uh, to try to create a sort of way to map places. So this piece is called Control Tower and I, created um, basically the coordinates from, it's an, it, believe it or not, it's an abstraction um, of a QR code. The initial starting point is the idea to do the control tower. And then I would posit that as like a latitude and longitude, and then I would sort of think about how that you can generate QR codes. So we would generate a QR code. And for anybody who doesn't know a QR, what a QR code is, it's it's a, uh, a barcode that takes you to a place. And it takes you to not just, I mean, the old fashioned barcode was just for like a product, like a can of soup. And the QR code is actually for like, I mean, a, you could have a QR code for this event. So it, it's event specific and it's place specific. It's not product specific. So I started to think about that technology and I tried to make it my own. Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah, um, something that, that continues even further down the road. I wanted to talk for a second about the sound graphs, because oh, that's yeah. sort of, yeah. mm -hmm. this is sort of the most recent uh, direction in which you've pushed your yeah. paintings. These, I think a lot of these come out of the, one of the most, rec the, the most recent film, Find yeah. It an Infinite Game. Should we show a clip of that? Yeah, yeah let's if we can. find it. Uh, so, so, this is, yeah. so this is a film that I did um, about a year ago. It's called Finite and Infinite Games, and it, I decided I'd been asked uh, if I would be interested in making, uh, taking a look at Herzog and de Meuron's um, Philharmonic Space in Hamburg. So I said yes. I was really amazed by the building. Like it's really incredible building in Hamburg. It's a little bit like being inside of a wasp's nest. It's like very vertical and the sound is exquisite. And um, anyway, I, I decided to use this book called Finite and Infinite Games and we made a script out of the book, and I asked the poet and filmmaker, um, Alexander Kluge, to read extracts uh, of this script that I had 
written, and then we combined it with images. Uh, and I'll show you this clip. If you could play it. Thank you. Okay. Zwecke. Die ist sozusagen, also, also sie hat keine Zwecke. Sie ist niemand untertan. Die Worte sind Rebellen, ja, nicht? Die gehorchen nicht, ja? Und das ist bei der Jurisprudenz anders. Ja? Da sind sie höflich, da sind sie, ähm, äh, verstehen sie äh, den Kopf des anderen, ja? Sie sprechen mit den Worten des anderen. Und so bin ich zweisprachig aufgewachsen, ein Amphibium, bis hierhin, ja, mich im Wasser und hier auf Land. So here you have this, uh, you know, famous German theorist who is a poet, but he's also a lawyer. So. He's talking about these two ways of speech. Yeah, these two binary, you know, like opposite contradictory things that are going inside all of us constantly. And I started to think about using speech and using the visualization of speech as a way to start a new series of paintings. Um, this is a, that's a piece called War of red piece was a piece called War of Roses, which I just recently uh, showed in Vienna. And this is a painting called Bad School. So there's different ways to visualize this, to visualize the speech. And I would take the exact phrase, like, so that, that is bad school. Bad and I would, school. bad school, yeah. And, then this, and this, this, is, is, this is a piece that actually I first did at the UCCA, maybe you can show that image too, but um, this is a painting called Society is abstract, culture is concrete, which I really like that inverse dynamic. And I do, think, I do believe that, uh, that culture is a, is a concrete thing. Yeah, it's not, it's not really abstract. It's actually a very, it's a lived phenomenon and you're actually making something, you know? It's like, it's, yes, it is abstract. Yes, it is philosophy philosophical, but they're actually, they're, they're these very real, tangible experiences and things that we're producing, yeah. Well, that's a great place to go, as our uh, prompter has been urging me to do for a few minutes now to, to, uh, to question. Okay. I think. So we're happy to hear from anyone. I keep on asking you questions. <laughs> uh, oh, hello? hello? Is this working? Yeah. Uh, Sarah, I, I wanted to ask you actually about the factor of time and how important that is in your projects. And, uh, and, and do you think of these, of your works? I mean, how, how much do you pay attention to time as a factor? Well, time is really important. Uh, for sure, because what's going on around me obviously predicates where I'm going, where I'm traveling to, what I'm interested in. If I'm in Los Angeles in 2004, it's because I felt like you know this idea of celebrity and and um, the film industry was something that I was interested in. If I was in Beijing. In 2008, that's very time specific. For instance, the Clinton, you know, the Capitol pieces were done right before the end of that era. I mean, granted, I didn't know what was going to happen, but uh, I felt like that was an important end of something, the end of like, you know, uh, something important. And um, that was like a year before 9 11. So I think time is very specifically important in relation to the films because of this notion of spectacle. So, you know, I do like to film around a certain time. Like with the Abu Dhabi film, I filmed 
around National Day. That was always the conception of the film. You know, the first, first proper scout I did, I made sure that we went to the National Day uh, celebrations because I really wanted to see that representation and that um, sort of parade and that sort of way in which a country um, represents itself. So I'd say time is pretty important in a way. This Any other question? Tala? No, not Tala. Sorry. Hello? Okay. Um, I just got the chance yesterday to see more of your film on Abu Dhabi. I had seen sit, like vignettes of it, the Fa Falcon Hospital and the bus station before online. And I was wondering if you could speak more about the different levels of narrative that exist in your film. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, the level of the image and then there's the other level of sound. As you said, they don't always run parallel, but I found also somehow the sound creates a narrative. Um, this, you know, the music kind of had this sense of surreal anticipation and also ran at a very different tempo from the motion of the image as well. And you were talking about time and the movement of time. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more about some of the, I mean, beyond the National Day celebrations and looking at the city uh, through this sheen, um, there's a lot of interesting moments about, you know, just people kind of waiting for something to happen mm -hmm. that kind of is juxtaposed with a very fast look yeah. at veneer of the city. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about your well, choice. Absolutely. There's, there's the, the timing of the spectacle, yeah, and, or of the event or this representation of a place, um, perhaps you want to call it. And then there's, then there's everything around it, yeah? And so the scene at the bus station I love because you get this, first of all, it's just a fantastic piece of architecture. I hope it never gets knocked down. Uh, you need to go, Phil, to the central bus station. Uh, it's like pistachio green. It's like designed by a, a Bulgarian firm. Um, and I was saying this morning, it's like how that came to be in Abu Dhabi, I have no idea, but it's really interesting. Um, and, and that's one thing that really interested me in Abu Dhabi is like this uh, sort of layers of different architecture and, and layers of, of people. And I think that's really important in the film that you see uh, not just the aspirational spaces of Mazdar and, and different moments of like where you want a country to go and where you want uh, people to go, but that you also see these in-between spaces, you know, of, of no action and, and people waiting for a bus or moving towards some place, they're not necessarily sure where they're going. Um, but those, those, those type of scenes in, in the films are really important. Um, just as in the Los Angeles film, it's important to have an A-list actor in the film, but it's also important to have a young actress or a young actor who you don't know who they are, but they're in a casting session, or there's this desire to be in that space, uh, or there's this, you know, there's a momentum there of, of some sort. Or in the Beijing film, where you have like people sleeping publicly during the 2008 Olympics, I think it's fantastic. Like you sort of have these different moments of, uh, I don't know if I would call it resistance, but there's just different moments all happening within the same place. Like, and, and I really think that like cities, that's what interests me narrative wise in terms of, you know, your mind completes the narrative. Yeah. You can make whatever narrative you want going on in my work. I mean, I think it's sort of an open text, both in terms of the paintings and the films. Um, but you're thinking, you know, that, that if you really define cities, they're not just conspiracies, they're actually like 
hundreds and millions of fragmented narratives which you never are going to know the ending of or the beginning of, right? So your mind is sort of, uh, I mean, that's what's exciting about the city is that you don't, you don't actually know. And there's also this element of extraordinary in the ordinary. So it's almost like your eye, when it focuses on the fish market, everything looks strange, though it's familiar in a sense. That's what. And my last comment was just, do you have any influences or anyone who you think kind of served, not as a mentor, but had impact? Because I see a bit of Wes Anderson, or I don't know, like there's something a little bit desolate and beautiful at the same time in the scenes. I was just wondering I, I, if. I like Wes Anderson. Yeah. But I've never, I've never thought about that uh, before, but I do like the way he creates uh, a sort of universe inside of a place. Uh, that's a really interesting idea. Um, but I suppose, uh, I mean, I really, I, I started off. I, I, I didn't go to art school. I, I, I studied uh, um, film theory and and political philosophy. So I really do think. And we were going to talk about this, but we didn't have time. But, but I really like the idea that that art brings together all of these disciplines. Yeah, uh, it brings together film, industrial design, architecture, the entertainment world, law, intellectual property rights, and all the rest of it. Like that, all of these things impact how you make work. I suppose um, artists that interest me from the past have done precisely that. I think, I think Rick, you know, Richter or Warhol or even Brutars on a very sort of skeletal level played with that, these forms and how a museum would be set up. Um, but I like to think in terms of systems and also the failure of systems, yeah? I mean, it's not just about, it's, it's not all just good. We're, we're, we're almost at the very end. I just I thought we'd be remiss if we didn't talk really quickly about this project we did together earlier this year yes. um, at UCCA, which was your retrospective, probably most complete retrospective mm -hmm. to date. It included all 13 uh, of the films that you've made since 1998. Um, this massive wall painting that was just behind Two. us. Two wall paintings. <laughs> the one you can see on the left, it's the Society's mm -hmm. Culture. Society's Abstract Culture is Concrete, but the other one as well. Dr. Um, Caligari. Dr. Caligari. Yeah. And, and in fact, also with uh, due to the great generosity of Guggenheim Abu Dhabi and everyone here, uh, was we were able to show the Abu Dhabi yeah, film in great. Beijing as well, yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of as a bookend to the Beijing film, which yeah. was um, anyway a, a nice example of we were just talking about making. That was making a really your, super fun show to work on with you. One because of time being sort of like we had a deadline, but also and also the vastness of that space. And it's really I love um, I love when you are able to put work into a space and deal with this sort of, I don't know, there's something really overwhelming about that great hall that's like a very big challenge to, to like cover the entire arc of the work from painting to film, to wall painting, to architecture, to film sketch, to drawing, you know, we really sort of Posters. covered, yeah, we, what? Posters. Poster, all the film posters, you know, we just sort of covered everything and it was um and also the show was a labyrinth too right because you were sort of blocked at time like you couldn't see the whole wall right. painting uh, i remember your this. call from, <laughs> from beijing saying but you can't see the whole wall painting and i was like yeah that's the point that's the like <laughs> you don't you want to be able to like explore it from very extreme angles sort of like a like almost like a kafka-esque yeah. situation um but that was sort of Part of it is mapping that out architecturally, the show, the idea of uh, exhibition. Great. Well, speaking of time, uh, we're out of it. Um, so I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to stop here. But thank you so much for thank telling you. us, uh, explaining and exploring so much about your, your work and, um, and for, 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 for what you've given to us and to art. Thank, thank you. you.